myself When the bell begins to chime Reflecting on my past life And it doesn't have much time Cause at five o'clock They take me to the gallows for
Hi, and welcome to part two of our two-part series, The DNA of Iron Maiden. In part one, we looked at the very early days of the band and the ex-members who formed that distinctive Iron Maiden sound. In this second part, we'll carry on looking at the members that came and went through the band Iron Maiden. And we'll also be looking at Derek Riggs, the creator of Eddie, Iron Maiden's icon, the band's manager, the band's predominant producer, and we'll also be looking at the side projects that various members of Iron Maiden have done over the years. Steve Harris, founder and bassist of Iron Maiden. He formed the band British Lion in 2012 and has released two albums with the band, namely the self-titled British Lion in 2012 and The Burning in 2020. Harris has taken the band on two separate European club tours in 2013 and 2014, with an additional tour taking place in 2016. Harris toured the UK in 2022 with British Lion on The Burning Tour. Three singles have been released from that album, namely Spitfire, October 2018, Lightning, October 2019, and The Burning, December 2019. The album was released through Parlophone Records. A river below The sky is a fire The cities are gold Your life in the making You're about to work This is nature As your feet in the sand Crashing away Yeah. 
Dave Murray, Adrian Smith's guitar cohort in Maiden, was there practically from the very start of I'm Maiden and has only done one side project outside of Maiden itself. He appeared with his old mate Adrian on the Hear and Aid single. This was a charity record which was put together by the late great Ronnie Dio and it featured no less than 40 musicians from the world of heavy metal and hard rock in 1986. The project also featured the likes of Jack Blades, Jimmy Bain, Ingrid J. Malmsteen, Jeff Tate, the names go on. Proceeds from the single and the associated video release and compilation album went to Famine Relief in Africa. We are here today right. and today is the international release of the new Maiden album. <laughs> well, I better not do that so you guys can take a look. Cool. Um, now, this is called Fear of the Dark, Yep. and um, I've heard that, well Bruce said when No Prayer for the Dying came out that he felt it was the heaviest since uh, Number of the Beast. How do you feel about this one? Um, yeah, this album actually, is, it's very, the songs, there's some real heavy stuff on there, but there's a lot of mood, and I try to create a lot of uh, different feels, you know, there's, and there's a lot of melody over the top of it, you know, yeah, it still retains the, the, the raw Iron Maiden sound. It's a really yeah. mature album, there's some fantastic uh, song ideas on there. I'm very proud of it. The sound of this album is really 90s. The last one we went in and we did it live and it was kind of, it was a bit like back to the roots kind of thing. It was spontaneous and everything, but this one spent a bit of time with the sound and made it a bit more bigger. I'm really pleased with it. It Excited. sounds great. We think it does too. Be Quick or Be Dead is a killer, killer tune. And what we're going to be doing here is taking calls from you any minute now, but we're going to play a video first. And uh, the, the number is 1-800-265-MUCH, which is 6824. And please, please dial very carefully. We're going to come back in a minute. But first, we're going to play a video that you guys wanted to see. Yep. Holy smoke from No Prayer for the Dying. The most inexpensive video ever. It costs three and six. No, it was seven as well, was it? Three and six. Three pounds six and seven. Three pounds six and six. What, to develop the film? <laughs> yeah. Did Steve That's shoot it? it? Steve Harris? Yeah, he did it. He did the whole lot. We mm. decided there's that many really expensive videos about. We just do one ourselves, and it was so much fun. And I think the kids liked it. You know, I yeah. liked it. Well, it's, it's total, like yeah. Iron Maiden no natural. You know. Yeah, yeah. Really I mean, you know, shots of Danik in the swimming pool, and you know, in, in the rivers. What was and it was just a lot of, lot of fun. <laughs> He's playing the guitar, that little plastic one. Oh you know? yeah. You'll that was it. a kid. That was Steve's yeah. kid's guitar. Yeah. yeah. That's the best. That's the best guitar I've ever played. That that little plastic guitar. <laughs> that plastic guitar. That's Steve's little show. girl. Yeah. In the video. Okay. Well, let's check it out. Holy smoke on the par 30 and we'll be back with Iron Maiden. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> We'll be back with more Iron Maiden. The number to call for your questions is 1-800-265-MUCH. Dial very, very carefully. MUCH is 6824. But first, let's check out some of the new metal releases, which of course includes Fear of the Dark. More with Maiden in a moment. Pepsi Power 30 live with Iron Maiden in the studio and I think we have our first call and we have a few friends outside too <laughs> of Yannick Gers and Dave Murray in the studio. Okay, we've got Bijan in Vancouver, BC. Hi Bijan. Hi. How are you? All right. You have a question for one of our guests or both? Uh, yeah, about the artwork. Um, yeah, how come you've got a new artist and uh, will the uh, old artist uh, for your covers, Derek Riggs, be doing any more for you? Um, yeah, actually with the new album we wanted to, the, the songs are a lot different from what we've done before in the production, the sound is different, so we just felt the artwork should reflect the, the music and everything, and so we tried, you know, Derek sent in some artwork, we had a lot of other guys sent in some artwork, and um, we just felt that this new Eddie kind of reflected how the band stands now. Very spooky, like the fear of the dark should conjure up the imagery of like, you know, being frightened, and we feel that 
that actually represents a band very good. You know. Okay, thank you very much, Bijan. It is. All right, thanks. Yeah. Uh, come to Vancouver this time. Okay, we'll see, see you there. We'll try see you there. Where is he? It's good, mate. He's on the telephone. <laughs> It's on the old dog. I'm yes, born. it is. Uh, it is a little spooky. Perhaps that reflects the, the mood of the album a little it's, bit. Yeah, as well. it does. It, the, the image of the album works great with that cover. It really does. And the thing is, it's kind of Nosferatu, you know, the old German movie. It's got that eeriness about it, and we like it. So, mm. you know, we use Derek again in the future. It's just a one-off. Yeah. But Eddie's he's changed now. He's a bit vampirish <laughs> and a bit gothic. <laughs> he's getting yeah. up. <laughs> he's growing he looks up. Looks like me and Dave. You know, the the morning after the night before. Yeah. Actually, I look like, like this morning. Morning. No, I look like that this morning. In yeah. fact, I look like that the drunk this afternoon. Too many. <laughs> yes. Okay, we've got Mark on the line. Mark from Edmonton, Alberta. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, um, in 85, 86, for the World Slavery Tour, you guys had major theatrics. Are you going to go ahead with those again this year? Um, yeah, we're going to come back with production. Um, it'll be based on the album. And uh, we've we done a couple of tours somewhere in time past, they, they got mega, you know, yeah. theatrics, you know, inflatable castles and everything. So we took it as far as it could go, but we feel like this time it'd be good to get a production going, lights and all that stuff. Yeah, the last yeah. album was very back to basics, so this time there's a lot more imagery involved with this one, isn't there? Mm. So we're just going to try, you know, there'll be a bigger production this time. But the last album, it was right to go back to basics and put the band back in front. Because before I think the, the band had been hidden by the overblown production that they had. And now the band is, it's so hot, it was really important to get the band back at the front of the stage. But we probably take a bigger production out this time. Mm. I think that's right. Yeah, so big, big one, big one. Yeah, and we're going to play on 12, isn't it, Dave? Well, 12, between 12 Dave and 20, 12 all the time. <laughs> we're going to play. <laughs> there was a little more par down last time. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, Cheers, cool. Mark. See you Cheers. Yeah, see you there. Bye. See, everybody wants you to come to their town. I know, we actually we try and get everywhere on this tour. You've yeah. got to get a world tour yeah. happening. Yeah. We are, we're starting in June in Iceland. We're going to do a warm-up gig there. Well, and we warm the Ice Iceland people up, the igloos. And uh, then we're going to come to Canada, hopefully. Yeah. All right. It just depends yeah. on the availability of the halls, That's really, right. as to where we can get in. And then we're going off to America after that. Okay, I, I've got to ask you more about that because uh, that was sort of my next question. But I thought that one of the We've colleagues was bringing it, it up. We've preempted it up. the question. Let's see what Tony yeah. from Fregenton. Fre oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> Do I know Canadian geography? No. <laughs> New Brunswick. Tony, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Yannick. Hello there. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, did you find much difference uh, in playing on your six and solo album from No Prayer for the Dying? Um, yeah. Can't, we try to do a few different. Be quiet! <laughs> we, try, we try to do a few different things on Bruce's album with his voice, you know? And then, um, yeah, it was probably to the left. It was more rock and roll than the Maiden thing, but we brought that element of rock and roll into No Prayer for the Dying. So to me, it made Bruce sing a different way. So it was, you know, it's really good for that. And on this album, the new album, he's singing even better. I'm, I'm really proud of his singing. He's, some, some of the, the vocals that he's got on there are just outrageous. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I'm, it sounds great. Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Hey. Cheers. Um, before we go into the next caller, I have to bring this up now, since someone has yet. What is this, the tour? Is it going to happen with Black Sabbath and Testament? We're not sure yet, I, I don't think. Do yeah, I think maybe Testament uh, looks like they're going to be on, and I think we're just going to do one show with Black Sabbath. Do um, you know where? No, no, I'm not sure actually at all. But uh, we hope maybe to take out two bands, so it'll be like a three band deal this time. And um, as you were saying, we're actually going to do two tours this time. We're going to do like a four month tour, take a break, then come back out again. So we're going to be coming through Canada twice. And when will we'll see you in tour. Canada? Um, about the second week in June, we're going to be in town. The first time, and what about the second time? Um, probably late, later on, towards the end of the year. We'll no, back. I think it'll be 93. Well, 93, 93, yeah. 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 On, the, on the second leg of so that it's going to be about a year. Yeah, so. It'll be like Happy New Fear. So we can come back to Happy New Fear to her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eve in St. John, <laughs> Newfoundland. <laughs> Go ahead, Eve. Hi, Adrian. Fine. Uh, how are you doing? Excellent. That's good. Or is it bogus? <laughs> <laughs> are you guys coming to uh, St. John this year? We're going to try and get round Canada as best we can, but it's, it's difficult to get the halls booked in the time that we're actually around but you know we're going to do the best we can to get as far around Canada as we can it depends on hall availability really yeah okay that's great uh, where's Bruce tonight 
Uh, his wife's just had a baby, so oh, he's at home. Oh, congratulations! Rocking yeah. the baby. Yes. He's rocking the baby. Yeah. He rang me up at three in the morning to tell me the other night. And, oh, that's great! Mm. And foolishly, I said we'll go out for a drink when I get back. You know, which is going to be at least two weeks of drinking. So. Oh no! But we started a couple of days ago, as yeah. soon as we heard. Yeah, as soon as we heard, we, we went did. Went straight head. out, had a yeah. few drinks, got the thing going. You know. A boy or a girl? Yeah. Little boy. boy. Oh. And he's going to call it Griffin. Griffin. You said it, not me. <laughs> that's no, it's Boy. great. It's okay, good. Yannick, that's it. Yannick's going now. This is going to be Dave. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michelle in Creston, BC. Go ahead, Michelle. Hello. <laughs> My question is, since you've been going for uh, over 20 years now, uh, is there anything that you felt you've had to compromise to keep up with the time? Well, Dude. after going for wait, 20 years, so that's 20. quite a well. Um, I think probably more like 15 or 16, yeah, something hasn't like been that. Quite nearly 20 close, yet. yeah. We'll probably reach the year 2000. Oh, yeah. It'll probably be like 20 years, I, I, I hope. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the success of the band has been like, you know, touring, albums, to that sort of thing. We're still going to be going. Lots of albums. Yeah, we'll have wheelchairs. Yeah, we'll have, yeah. We'll be yeah, 90. New material we'll be, yeah. all the time. Yeah. When we're 90, we're going to be I think have the wheelchairs and we'll be <laughs> wheeling yeah. about the stage going. With a little Run Iron Maiden coming along. Exactly. That's it, yeah, we'd have like pyros, pyros coming out the back and you now, know. The thing is we've just yeah. got a, a real enthusiasm for playing live and basically that's it. We, we really love playing live. And, and that hasn't changed. Yeah, from mm. now I'm, only, I'm only new in the band, I've been there two years now, but the, when, we, when we do gigs, everyone is so excited. That, that's what we do it for. Okay, let's throw to a couple of the videos that you wanted to see and uh, Guns N' Roses, oh, Led Zeppelin I think we only have time for, so let's check it out. Led oh, Zeppelin yeah. on Power 30 and we'll be back. Yay! Okay. Back with Iron Maiden on the Power 30. We're going straight to a phone call here from Kelly and Christine in Calgary, Alberta. Go ahead. Um, hi, we were wondering, out of every place you've ever played, what's been your favorite and why? Oh, that's a so tough many one. places. <laughs> yeah. Um, Everywhere's good for different reasons. You just, you, you know, you try and, it's just good to play. Yeah. You can't pick a, I think Donnie 98. I was at the gig and I watched Dave and the boys and I think that was the pinnacle, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that was the band special. Where was that? Uh, in Donington. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think each, sure. each you know, show you do is special to the, the you know the, the fan that comes to the show. And for you, you kind of just put put on you know, when you put the best performance you can that night. So each show has a little bit of magic in itself. And um, so to have one particular, maybe Donington, is that that could be it. That was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry Thank you, that. Kelly and Christine. Cheers, Cheers Kelly. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 We're coming to the end of the show, unfortunately, it goes by fast, doesn't it? And we're going to play your new video, but let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, Yannick, you co-wrote it with Bruce Dickinson? Yeah, it's quite a topical thing. It's about it's about the corruption in big business. And it's something that the band, you know, it's been around. We see it happen in the BCCI thing. Uh, Robert Maxwell, you know, the, the problems that came out of his death. And uh, it just generally goes on. There's a lot of corruption in big business. And that's so what the song's about. So it's be quick or be dead, like, you better get them well, before they get you yeah, kind of a, yeah it's kind of there's a lot of insider dealing and stuff that goes on we all know about you know it's all there. It. you can't you can't but it's always the little people who tend to get caught for those things and the big people who make millions and billions get yeah. away with it do you ever feel part of a machine you know having put so many albums out being so successful no we're just five I mean, I feel, I, you know I think we're just five lads who play music and you know, yeah. people like it and uh, all right we are part of the, the you know the uh, the music musical machine in a way but you've got to keep your direction and do what you do and do what you believe in. Yeah, I don't think it's like you're playing the music and it's, you kind of just have to ca carry on. You know, I feel as enthusiastic about it now as I did like 10 years ago. Even more so now, I think, with, with this new album. Really? Yeah, it's so still, it's like still that childlike attitude about everything, you know, looking at the world through, you know, kids' eyes. Right? He's a child. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll kids it up, you know. And, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, you've like you've been with the band two years now. Yeah. So to you, is it, does it still feel really fresh? But then to you, it does too. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. does feel fresh. Because <laughs> the the thing is, we really enjoy going out and playing. That that's what we do it for, just to get out and play gigs. And we travel all these different countries. I mean, over in Korea, uh, a couple oh, of weeks ago. That's wild. And yeah. it's fantastic to get the culture of a place like that and take it in and then regurgitate it with some different songs next time. And I think the, the songs in this album are re a reflection of the things that we've experienced. In the last oh. two years. Yeah, I was reading through the lyrics, and there aren't, you know, a lot of like mythical beasts and oh, 
old English literature, things like that. It seems to be about the real world. Yeah, it's more about current affairs, really. Um, there's a few songs that talk about things that happened last couple of years, really. And whereas, yeah, it's not to say in the future we may go back into that, you know, that sort of you know, writing stuff about yeah. books. And hey, there's no rules, stuff. you know. It's music. We can do what we like. Yeah. So it's fun to just go off on a tangent. I, I, that's the thrill of it. Yeah. There's no EMI or any company, Sony or anybody, telling us what to do. We just do it and give them it, and it's up to them to put it out. You know, there's no direction from an outside source. We just do what we feel yeah. is right. We've got actually a broad base to work yeah. on. We can, you know, we can go spread ourselves out over a lot of things. We're not kind of stifled, just right. channeled in one thing. So, right. you know, that's that's the beauty, I think, of it all. Yeah. Now, if you're going to tour, are you going to tour with your extended families? The yeah. babies that have all come along in the last few years? Um, they'll we're probably come out yeah, for a couple of shows here and there. They won't actually travel, you know, because it's touring is hard enough in itself. But we're going to take so a crate of beer anyhow. Yeah, we'll take of, a uh, crate of beer. Yeah, a crate of lager. A crate, lager. okay. Yeah, <laughs> All right, let's check it out. Be quick or be dead. The new one from Iron Maiden. And thank you very much, both thank of you, you, Dave and Yannick, for joining thank us you. today. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks a lot, yeah. Appreciate it. Adrian Smith formed a project called ASAP in 1989. He took a break from my maiden after the seventh son of a seventh son tour. The band consisted of Adrian Smith, Andy Barnett, Dave Carwell, Richard Young and Zach Starkey, son of Ringo Starr. They released just one album called Silver and Gold through EMI Records. In 1993, Smith formed a band called The Untouchables. They never released anything and by 1994 they evolved into Psycho Motel, who released two studio albums, namely State of Mind in 95 and Welcome to the World in 97. That band consisted of Adrian, Gary Liederman, Solly, Mike Sturgis. They recorded with Sanctuary Records. That band disbanded in 1999. In 97, Adrian Smith then teamed up with his co-mate Bruce Dickinson for his own solo project to help on two albums and two tours. After this, both rejoined the Iron Maiden ranks in 1999. Adrian's latest project, named Smith Coatson, has been formed along with Richie Coatson, formerly, and probably still is, from the Winery Dogs. They toured in 2022 and have released a self-titled album oh yes sounds a bit like rock and roll doesn't it
I spoke to Bruce about it and he was really excited about, you know, getting teeth into them sort of lyrics and so he decided to write the whole album about, about it, make it a concept album. Right. Back to the uh, early 70s type <laughs> thing. Now, obviously, I mean, you did uh, an awful lot of the writing as well, Adrian. While you were writing, I know you, you, you tend to write separately, did you, when you were writing the songs, did you do it all with one story in mind? Actually, we co-wrote quite a lot of stuff together. Um, like me, Steve and Bruce wrote a couple together. Really? That's quite unusual, isn't it? Um, what, we doing stuff together? Oh, we've done, we? I think, uh, the album before last, we did a couple like that. Um, and uh, I think when we, we first discussed the idea of the Seventh Sound, we already had uh, the music for Moonshine. Right. And we got a demo. So it all came together. I think, yeah, when they were writing the lyrics, it was, uh, you know, bearing it in mind, it was a concept album. Musically, it's quite, uh, it's quite a departure for the band as well, isn't it? I mean, like, you're using a little bit of the old keyboards and stuff on it. Yeah, well, the reason for that was, um, you know, that uh, on the last album we used guitar synths, and this time I said to oh, Rachel, look, I, you know, I can't be playing this guitar synth on stage because it's like I've got to need a lead, and I can't have a lead because otherwise I'll trip my arse over it, you know what I mean? And um, and Rachel said he didn't want to be bothered with the pedals, didn't you? So we mm. just said, well, what we'll do, we just play it all on the keys and get um, get me bass roadie, Michael Kenny, who... Uh, the Michael, Count. The Count. The Count. Yeah, get him to play it, yeah. Well, he's actually going to be on stage with you then? Well, he'll be sort of uh, popping out, yeah, lurking. He'll be popping out from time to time, you know, sort of like, you know. Yeah, so you said, uh, Stu said, so it's <coughs> not a bother, you know, with pedals and stuff. Right. We won't probably only use it on five or six songs. Mm. But uh, it does sound, um, like the songs needed keyboards, you know. So it's just kind of background keyboards. Mm. So me and Steve were kind of playing two fingers and all this, because yeah. none of us are keyboard players. <laughs> not keyboard players at all. It was just like a couple of chords, like, from yeah, the next one. Like that next one, you know. <laughs> we're not really uh, that happening with the keyboards, isn't it, really? But it's it's just really straight stuff, like in the background, like string for effect, you know, like orchestration sort of thing. And um, especially on Seventh Sun itself, mm. um, there's a lot of like choir type, um, you know, vo big voice thing, you know. Right. Wanted to create like a uh, an almost sort of film type of. Uh, Sound, you know, like very atmospheric. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it worked out really well. I'm really pleased with it. There's uh, the lyrics on the new album. There, there, a lot of them are very, very strong. Uh, I can just imagine all those people in America that love to pick up on these things, like references to Lucifer and birth strangled babes and all this sort of thing. I can just imagine them pulling out those lines and going, "They're Satanists. They're devil worshippers." I mean, are you worried about that, that sort of reaction at all? Not really, because they, um, well, they always pull out the bits that they think you know they're going to get the most headlines with, I suppose. Um, but the old album is, is about, you know, um, good and evil, you know, life after death, whatever, infinity, the whole bit, you know. Um, it's just sort of questions the whole thing within the song, it strikes from the story of the seventh son of the seventh son. But um, they always just pick out those bits. I mean, mm. when we did the Number of the Beast album, it was just the one song, which was about a dream, and um, which ends up with a twist in it. I'm not saying I'm do either, but then again, I'm, we don't write about the occult. Right. Tell me, um, one of the things, of course, uh, a lot of people have mentioned over the last year or so, particularly while you've been away recording and, and what have you, is that, you know, thrash metal is the new coming thing. We have loads of letters into the show, people saying, you know, play more thrash metal and that. And, you know, you've got the bands out there like Metallica, Anthrax, people like that. While you were recording this album, how, how aware were you that, you know, you've got these people now chasing you, like trying to steal your crown? I mean, were you very aware of that? Um, in a way, I would say that, um, if anything, we would have tried to steer away from all that sort of thing, because, I mean, well, I'm not really a, a great fan of fresh metal, I must admit. I mean, it's, to me, there's not enough melody in it. It's just, it's like, um, like lots play. of energy, you know, play, yeah. Play very well, but, uh, you know, the music is kind of, was not very musical. Yeah. You know, they certainly play. You probably get, um, Hundreds of these bands in a couple of years, there'll be a couple of bands around that have got a bit of substance, a bit of depth, you know. they have actually got songs and can rise above well. Yeah. But I think they'll have to broaden their horizons a bit, you know. I think that a lot of bands seem to be scared, even like even the thrash bands or whatever, that they're scared to write anything uh, remotely melodious. Yeah. Because their hardcore fans go, they're selling out, you know. <laughs> Which is just bloody stupid, you know. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. 
that's not my cup of tea at all, I'll be honest. It's, it's funny though, I mean, you, you know, obviously you're not, you're not particularly big fans of that sort of music, but so many of these bands, you say to them, well, you know, who's your influences? And they go, oh, I'm Maiden, you know, I mean... You know, a lot of art support, yeah, exactly. haven't we? <laughs> 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 what, what, what do we do, well, then? Uh, but, uh, no, there's a, there's a couple of decent bands out there. You mentioned a couple of them, you know, Metallica and Frank's it. Um, Metallica, I've always said, and I've told Lars as well anyway, I'd, I'd not keen, never been keen on the vocals. I think if they had a really uh, strong singer, I think it'd make that of a difference. Because I think also, I think maybe it probably restricts their writing, that, you know, that it's all sort of sung at one level. Right. And um, you can't, I know from even writing with Bruce, you know, like going from Paul to Bruce, most things that are throw at Bruce sort of thing, you know, he, he, can, he can go for anything you throw at him, you know, like he'll have a go, you know. Because um, he can sing high and low and light and shade. Uh, whereas I think a lot of these fresh singers just, you know, well, <laughs> you know he's like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like me now at the moment. After a few, few beers last night, you know, it's like I could probably get away with it now. Now my voice is a bit, a bit, uh, a bit gone. You know? Now listen, the, the, the next world tour starts in May, I'm told, out in Canada, I think. And uh, you're only going out for about six or seven months this time, aren't you? Yeah, Had to be sure a mini tour well. by your standards. Yeah, a jaunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you looking forward to it? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's been a long while since we've been on the road. Isn't it? Yeah, it's we been finished. Up. We finished last, but last year, last May. <clears throat> Mind you, we, we had a, uh, probably three or four months off, but we spent from from October working on the album rehearsing. So you know, we've had a bit of time off, so we're ready to go now. Yeah, recharging our batteries and. Uh, Especially, you know, when you finish an album as well, apart from wanting to play it to everybody, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you want to get out and actually play on stage. And, you know, yeah. it's really, it's nice because we've been off the road long enough now to actually really want to get out there. And it's not like uh, someone saying, oh, you know, you've got to go back home and do another two. It's, like, it's not one, it's not like that, you know, we're really raring to go, like, you know. Now, of course, uh, everybody knows now that you're going to be headlining at Castle Donington this year. You're also going to be doing the, the Monsters of Rock festivals in Europe. Now, people have been waiting for this to happen for such a long time, and finally you're doing it. <coughs> what, uh, why now? What made you decide to do it this year? It just feels right, doesn't it, at this point. I think that, yeah. um, I mean, fans have been coming out and saying for a few years, oh, why don't you do Donington, why don't you do Donington? And um, it just feels the right time to do it. I mean, it'd be fantastic to have all the maiden fans in one place. I mean, it should be unreal, you know. Um, and the last time it was remotely like that was Reading, and that was quite a long time ago now. Mm. So, um, it's, um, well, we're looking forward to it, put it that way, you know. Yeah, plus we get a chance to do a real big show as well, outdoors. Ha quite spectacular. Have you already re worked out what the stage show is going to be like? Um, yeah, but we ain't telling you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, it's just a little bit, <laughs> a bit of a clue. Go on. Uh, well, we can't really, can we? We can't give it away, you know what I mean? It'd be pretty spectacular. We've uh, actually sold our old lighting rig, because um, we used it you know, like two or three different versions of it and uh, we've sort of worn it out really. So we've got a completely new lighting rig. Um, it won't actually be moving about as much but we've got like more lamps uh, so we want a different approach to it this time. And um, there's quite a good, uh, few good special effects but obviously I can't say too much about them. Do you know who else is going to be on the bill yet? Can you tell us that or is that a big secret as well? Um, well, Dave Leroff is definitely confirmed. Um, there's, there's talk about either uh, Kiss or uh, which actually by the time it goes out, one of them might be confirmed. I don't know. Um, also, I think Halloween, um, Poison. Um, it's one of two other bands been talked about as well. Isn't it? We also pro pro well, hopefully Aerosmith if they're mm. into doing it. I mean, you know, if we could get something like us, Kiss or Art, Dave Lee Roth, you know, Aerosmith, Poison, Halloween. That'd be, uh, That'd be great, yeah. pretty good bill, eh? Yeah. But I mean, we're trying for the best bill possible, obviously. It's just a question of whether other bands want to do it, really. Right. You know, we've asked a few bands and uh, we're waiting to sort of hear back at the moment whether they want to do it or not. And if they don't, tough, we'll get someone else. <laughs> 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 All right, then, so look, I, I really do look forward to it. And lots of luck. I'll be there and hopefully we'll be there with the cameras as well. And we'll, you know, we'll have a good day. Yeah, yeah cheers. Man. cheers. Nico McBrain joined Adrian Smith, I Maiden's guitarist, along with members of FM and Urchin, to form a band called the Entire Population of Hackney. 
they played just two concerts in 1985. One at the legendary Marquee Club in London on the 19th of December 1985. The other also at the Marquee. But not a lot is known about this other concert. Nico has also famously worked with a megastar, Sooty. He appeared on the Sooty Show in 1988 on the 10th of March show. The episode was called Hidden Talent. Sooty invited Nico to a drum battle. This is why Nico always has Sooty on the front of his drum kit. Nico, I don't know if you know, but uh, Sooty and Sweet, they've been playing the drums a bit, and they wondered if we could, like, play along with you. Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Do the cross there, Sooty, to your kit, and give yourself four in on the bass drum. Go on. Okay. Air Raid Siren Dickinson is of course the front man of Iron Maiden and has been pretty much since the early 80s apart from the brief spell when that post was taken by Blaze Bailey Solo wise Bruce has released six solo albums namely Tattoo Millionaire in 1990, Balls to Picasso in 94, Skunk Works in 96, Accident of Birth 97 and Chemical Wedding in 1988. The last solo album that he did was called Tyranny of Souls and that was released in 2005. In 1989 he wrote a song for the film A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5. The song was called Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. It featured in the movie soundtrack and also on Iron Maiden album No Prayer for the Dying. The only Iron Maiden single ever to go to number one in the UK charts. Bruce has appeared in the film The Chemical Wedding which was released in May of 2008. This was a film that Bruce was very, very keen to take a bigger part of as he possibly could. The film, Chemical Wedding, was released in May of 2008. It was about the reincarnation of Alistair Crowley, with the title track coming from Bruce Dickinson's own 1998 album Chemical Wedding. Bruce has recorded many songs with many different bands over the years and has appeared on charity singles and film scores. Dickinson is also a highly accomplished pilot and flies the band around whenever they tour in Ed Force One. He's also a member of the Great Britain Fencing Squad. He has written novels, been on the radio as a DJ, and he's doing the Friday Rock Show on BBC Radio 6. He collaborated with Robinson's Brewery to create Trooper, a 4.8% bottled ale. All these he still does to date, along with his talks that he does every now and then, and those are always well worth checking out. Chemical wedding, my friends! So oh. 
guest now on the program is Bruce Dickinson. You just saw his solo video called Tears of the Dragon. Bruce, welcome to the show. Hello. Nice to see you again, as always. Okay, how long ago was it since you left Iron Maiden? Um, it was probably getting on for approaching six years now. How many solo albums have you put out now that you've got the new one called The Chemical Wedding? Uh, this is actually number six, five in the studio, one live, and since leaving the band, five albums. Okay, how come you're more productive than they are? Uh, I think it's just one of those uh, situations when when you have a band and it you know it achieves a certain sort of longevity. Um, uh, it just takes longer. I mean, for one thing, um, I used to say that every time I did an Iron Maiden album, it it was like eighteen months gone, right? Because by the time you toured it and everything else. Um, you didn't have chance to make another record. I mean, so I mean, I don't tour as long as they do, uh, mainly because I can't. <laughs> you know, because I don't sell enough tickets. You know, right. in the same way. Um, At this time. Yeah, sure, sure. But you know, being realistic about it, so I tend to go back in and 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 just make records, which actually is. Uh, in many ways the most rewarding part of it for me. The, the creative bit is the bit that, that keeps me fired up. Mm. Um, the live thing is enormously, it's, it's great fun and I do love doing it but as, you know, I don't derive pleasure just from getting on the treadmill and saying, you know, you know, my life is the road and I can't imagine anything else. I can imagine a lot of other things, you mm. know, including making a new record, you know, and things. So that's I have a slightly different perspective to some people, maybe. But what you're really doing is also is building up one hell of a catalogue, aren't you? I mean, if you, this is your sixth album, that's an enormous catalogue of new material in six years. Um, yeah, the, the, what's interesting for me is that every album has also been different. So every album has explored a different aspect. I mean, it's all rock music. It's not like I'm suddenly making jazz albums and things. But every album has some facet that's slightly different. Although uh, the last couple, Accident of Birth and Chemical Wedding, have certainly been sort of more closely related, I think. You know, there's, there's been a sort of a follow-on from one to the other, mm. um, which probably is... Um, Probably is a good thing. I think you know, certainly my manager is very happy about that. Um, I think it's uh, it's sort of pretty much. Uh, I feel it's like I'm sort of duty bound to try and make interesting records each time, because otherwise, what's the point of making records? Absolutely, you might as well stay at home and, and just enjoy what you've what you've already created. But uh, can I put this to you? And I hate comparisons, but inevitably they will be drawn, if not by me, by somebody else. Mm. And indeed have been drawn by people in the press, the rock press in the United Kingdom. This album, The Chemical Wedding, is the album, really, that Iron Maiden should have made. <laughs> well, all right. Um, that is, that's the area at which I, put, I bring down the big curtain and say, for all kinds of reasons, out of respect to my former band colleagues who I'm still friendly with, out of respect to all the fans who we uh, share, obviously, a lot, you know, a lot of people buy Maiden Records and buy my records, um, uh, it's, abs it's not worth me commenting on that, you know, uh, if I take it the right way, I, what, I, what I hear in that is, I hear people saying, you've made a great record, and I say, thank you very much. Because I've made a great record, you don't have to rag on somebody else's record. It's enough that you just like my record. Loyalty, all right. Tax, <laughs> honesty, <laughs> and above all, loyalty to your former mates as well. So, well, who am I, your mates? It's the thirteen, you know, thirteen years, and we yeah. did, you know, we did, um, you know, we we did go through uh, some uh, some fairly harrowing moments together, you know, and uh, that counts for a lot. Yeah, but you also went through some amazing concerts together, and that counts for a lot. Phenomenal audiences, and that counts for a lot too. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's play a track. This is the video, which is the first single, which is "Killing Floor." Right? Yeah, although it's not a single, we're not releasing any singles You're off joking. this record. No singles off this album. This ain't a singles album. This is an album. So I figure, why waste, you know, time, money, and energy? Why waste the audience's money, above all, mm -hmm. on, a, on a pipe dream, which basically is an ego trip for record companies. What, 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 what do people want? They want the album. Give them the album. Okay, not only will we give them Mr. Bruce Dickinson in a multitude of parts, surrounded by food, <laughs> and doing the job he always wanted to do, the job of the waiter, the chef, and everything else. Good little video. What's the story behind it, though? In fact, why a story? Because um, I like stories. It's why I got into music. Um, uh, I got into music because I wanted to tell stories, and I sort of, to a greater or a lesser extent, have 
failed, succeeded, and been still trying. Um, and um, I've always seen uh, video as being a, an extension to that. I do happen to like um, mucking around with videos. And um, uh, of course, the, in the world of shrinking budgets, you know, you never get the chance. But on this occasion, um, uh, this, and this actually goes back to the album title, The Chemical Wedding. The guy that directed this video was a friend of mine called Julian Doyle, uh, who was a sort of, uh, 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 he's a filmmaker. He, he was the film editor of Brazil and um, Time Bandits, um, Python and the Holy Grail, Life of Brian. Uh, he was basically the mentor of, of, of the Pythons in terms of the film world, of Terry Gilliam. And uh, we were actually doing a movie script together which we sold to America, called The Chemical Wedding, about uh, the uh, old English black magician, Alistair Crowley. Uh, the movie never got made. The title track to the movie got used on the last album, Accident of Birth, and the title of the movie was sitting around, and I thought, this is such a great title, I'm going to use it as the title of the album. So, lo and behold, when the time came to do the video, uh, I called up Julian and said, OK, we're going to do these two videos. Uh, we don't have a great budget. Um, can we do some uh, guerrilla movie making here? Actually, you and I did have a chat in the dressing room yeah. before, uh, before we came on camera and all that stuff, right? And you gave a really good resume of what's, what's occurred to you over the last six years with regard to album sales, what territories you've scored in, and how indeed it's building for you internationally. Yeah. Because don't forget, this is also an international show. It's going out in Israel, South Africa, and right. Bosnia, and all over the place. Right. So <clears throat> I think people overseas, as well as the people in the United Kingdom, would be interested in knowing that other territories ain't like the territory that we're sitting in at all when it comes to rock and metal. Hmm. Well, Eng England is it's, uh, it's quite strange how with the exception of the you know the Spice Girls and one or two sort of big ticket pop sort of items that occasionally sort of um, uh, surface over here the the the, the rest of our uh, like rock uh, sort of legacy if you like has just been reduced to rubble I mean, it, it, we're left with uh, Deep Purple and Page Plant, both acts which, you know, have obviously, you know, been going for a fair number of years. I mean, fantastic, but, you know, there should be some new stuff wandering around, and there isn't, because it's not encouraged by the press, you know, and it's positively sneered at. Oh, that old trad metal stuff, you know. Well, that old trad metal stuff is selling a hundred... 150,000 albums in Germany at the moment and throughout Brazil and in America it's it's really really coming back yeah I mean it's very true there is a, a metal revival yeah. in, in, but it's happening faster elsewhere oh than yeah it's happening oh, in the United abso Kingdom absolutely because because you know uh, it, the, there's a, a kind of a a really sneery snidey attitude to things over here they're, they're very mealy-mouthed in their in their praise sometimes about things in yeah, the really can be. okay on the Friday rock show this week we got six signed copies of Bruce Dickinson's new album which is called the chemical wedding it looks like this also, we're going to throw in some posters as well. Everything will be signed. All you have to do is to answer this extremely easy question, which is now going to be delivered to Camera 2 by Bruce Dickinson. Yes. Hello, Camera 2. Um, that this, one, uh, that one. That one. That one. Oh, that one, <laughs> one with a two on it. I thought I was looking at one with a red light flashing. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Mr. Dalek over there. Right. Um, uh, Julian Doyle. Uh, the director of um, at Killing Floor, uh, worked with me on one previous occasion uh, in a former incarnation, which I shall only hint at by saying it was not a million miles away from uh, uh, the band Ron Maiden and the Dixie Chickens, which we used to laughingly refer to ourselves as in those days. So, um, he worked with me before on a video. I just want to know which video it was. OK, and send your answer to this address in front of you right now, which is Friday Rock Show, 17 to 29 Holy Crescent, London NW 18T. Or you can get to me via the email as well, tommy at segway.demon.co.uk. Six copies of this album with six signed posters on the rack, possibly to you ASAP. Get the answer in fast to that question as to the by Mr. Bruce Dickinson. Let's have another track. From the from the record, I haven't seen this video. Yeah, um, this one is um, um, this was done in the film we had left over from the Killing Floor, <laughs> uh, but is actually the in some ways is is the uh, the main event in a lot of the countries uh, in terms of like radio and stuff like that. And in Brazil, where they play rock music in the daytime nope. on the national radio station, way hey, you know, um, it's uh, the most requested track at the moment. Um, okay. 
so I'm pretty chuffed with that. This is the tower. Twiddling the knobs on many an Iron Maiden album and producing some of the band's finest work. Music producer Martin Birch is, you could call him, was another member of Iron Maiden. He worked with the band from 1981 until he retired in 1992. Birch worked with a lot of other rock acts over the years, including the likes of Black Sabbath, Dio, Deep Purple, Rainbow and Whitesnake. Sadly, Martin Birch passed away on the 9th of August 2020 at the age of 71. The cause of his death was undisclosed. Members of Iron Maiden offered a lengthy tribute to him on their official website, with Steve Harris, Bruce Dickinson and Rod Smallwood reflecting on their time working with this amazing producer. A Peace of Mind was uh, produced and engineered by Martin Birch, Black Knight Birch. <laughs> Uh, he has also worked on your uh, previous albums, A Number of the Beast and Killers. That's right, yeah. Uh, how, is his, uh, how have his techniques uh, influenced Iron Maiden over the years uh, th well, that you've been working together with him? His technique is, is just encouragement, usually. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the great thing about Martin is that he's a very subtle producer in the way he works. Uh -huh. Because he doesn't actually suggest anything to do with the music at all. Uh -huh. Really? And that's, I mean, we uh -huh. write the music and arrange the music. Mm -hmm. And then he just, he engineers it. Oh, I see. And gets the performances out of us. Mm -hmm. He motivates. I see, yeah, yeah he's... As a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, I mean, uh, basically we don't uh, write songs for airplay or for anything else like that. Mm -hmm. So we don't need a producer who produces for that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. All we want is to get is good sound and to get a producer who... Um, it comes along and encourages us mm -hmm. and is, is critical and knows see Martin thinks the way we do mm -hmm. about the music so he can be really critical about well you can do a better guitar solo than that oh I see yeah or, mm -hmm. you know or uh, you know you know I'll be singing away and he go I think he can sing it a little bit better than that I think he can go for one more performance and push it a bit more mm -hmm. and that's how he works he's always mm -hmm. pushing bringing the last drop out of everything you do. I see. Do you find that uh, he and the band have uh, grown together as a sort of a team? Over oh, the yes. Years? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would, be I, I, it would be unthinkable to do an Iron Maiden album without Martin. <laughs> mm. A good ship always has a good captain. And that captain in the Iron Maiden ship is none other than Rod Smallwood. He's been Iron Maiden's manager since 1979 and he's still doing it today. He was joined by Andy Taylor in 1982. They have both managed the group ever since. Rod had managed Steve Harley and the Cockney Rebels before Maiden. Harley fired Smallwood for personal difficulties. Smallwood formed his own management company and called it Sanctuary, named after Iron Maiden's second single. This closed in, in 2007. Smallwood then formed Phantom Music Management with Andy Taylor, focusing solely on Iron Maiden. The band's song Sheriff Huddersfield is all about Rod and it can be found as a b-side to Wasted Years and that is well worth catching it is a very funny song indeed that was released in 1986 Midlander Blaze Blaley was the vocalist in I'm Maiden from 1994 until 1999 he replaced Bruce Dickinson while he was away doing his solo projects and movies, etc., etc., Blaze 
has the unenviable reputation of presiding over Iron Maiden during two of their worst ever concert seasons, tour seasons, and two of their weakest albums. Blaze was originally in the band Wolfsbane. They disbanded after Blaze left. He was with Iron Maiden for, say, just two albums, namely The X Factor and Virtual Eleven. Bruce Dickinson was later to return to Maiden in 1999, and Blaze started up a band later that same year under his own name. Blaze. They, in turn, disbanded in 2007, after releasing three studio albums, Blaze then started up a new band with self-titled name, Blaze Bailey. This was also known as BBB. The band was disbanded again in 2011 due to health and financial problems. They released two albums. Blaze announced that, that he would continue as a solo performer, working with different musicians. He has partnered with the likes of Paul Diano, also from My Maid, of course, in 2012, and they toured Russia as the Double Trouble Tour from 2012 until 2013. Blaze worked with the band Absolver until 2016. He released the Infinite Entanglement Trilogy in 2016 and that final, the final version of that came out in 2020. Blaze continues to work with different members of Absolver to date and has an arguably successful solo career. Conventional wisdom Imagining that there is nothing more Shall great said the speed of light is the constant If that can change then so can I Time to come into a new cause of action Time to stop repeating all the same hate For the way small things, anxiety and doubt I can begin to change my life now
You can't talk about ex-band members without talking about Clive Burr. He was the drummer in Maiden between 1979 and 1982. He played on the band's first three albums. He was replaced by Nico McBain in 1982. Um, he played briefly in band Trust, which Nico himself had actually come from. He had also played very briefly in Alcatraz. He formed his own band called Stratus, but finished after only one album. He joined the band Desperado, which was Dee Schneider's band which he formed when uh, Dee Schneider packed in Twisted Sister, of course. This never really got going due to a falling out with the band's record company. He's also played with the band Elixir, as well as Prey Mantis in the 1990s. He was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in the late 90s. Clive Burr sadly died in his sleep on the 13th of March 2013 in London only five days after his 56th birthday rest in peace man. when Alcatraz first got together uh, we were auditioning drummers and uh, Clive Burr from Iron Maiden was interested uh, and he came over uh, we <laughs> The record company flew him over from England, and Clive came, great guy, fantastic guy. And uh, we played with him for a couple of days. Uh, it wasn't the right fit drumming-wise. He had a very different style drummer than we had in mind. We were looking more for the Cozy Powell thing, and uh, him coming from Iron Maiden, obviously, was a different, different vibe. Um, anyway, so we weren't going to use Clive and loved the guy. We got along great and had some fun, but weren't going to use him. So our manager calls me up and says, hey, good news. He goes, I talked to Graham and Ingve and Gary and everybody loves Clive. So what do you think? And I said, well, I guess I'll go with the, the flow. So we all got together at, at Andy's house for a meeting and uh, he, <laughs> he shows us this piece of paper that he's got for Clive to sign. And uh, we're all looking at it, and I said something to Ingve. I said, uh, so you loved his drumming, huh? And Ingve goes, no, he's not the right drummer for the band. Who said that? And Graham goes, yeah, I didn't think so either. I want more of a Cozy Pal kind of vibe. And then Gary said the same thing. We all looked at each other, and Andy was like caught holding the bag. And so we busted him. He just wanted Clive and the band for the name, the Iron Maiden reference. So, uh, but that's what managers do. You know, they manipulate things. And we did that with about three other drummers that all had big names that weren't right for the band. Great drummers. Clyde was a fantastic drummer, just totally different than what we had in mind. So that's what managers do though, some managers. And uh, Andy was uh, a master at that.
Paul Diano was the vocalist with Maiden from 1978 to 1981. He featured on the band's first two full-length albums, I Maiden and Killers. He also can be heard on Maiden Japan the, the, and of course the Soundhouse tapes. Diano was released from the band on the 10th of September 1981 and he was replaced by Samson's vocalist Bruce Air Raid Siren Dickinson who is of course the current Iron Maiden vocalist. Over the years Paul has played with several bands. He had a solo band which was called Diano and he's also played in Gog Magog in 1985, Paul Diano's Battle Zone from 85 to 89, and in 1988, Praying Mantis, Killers, Nomad, Rockfellas, and lots of other projects besides. He now plays in the Norwegian Live Band. He's been in the country of Croatia for a while now, recovering and fighting with undisclosed medical conditions. Iron Maiden are paying all of Paul's medical bills because of their long-term and loving relationship. Once an Iron Maiden, always an Iron Maiden. Musical class. My future musical band. Ah, I'm going to have to work at McDonald's. <laughs> now, uh, now we, 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 did, um, we did five tracks in Germany last year. Um, but we've had a bit of uh, trouble with our record company on that, so we've uh, they've kept the songs, I've kept the songs, and we don't know what we're going to do with them. They're sort of very industrialised at the moment, so there you go. sort of take it on for now. At the moment, finish this tour first, then get this operation done on my leg, and then I'll worry about what else I'm doing. I've got 16 other tracks, um, which are in my suitcase in my hotel back in London. <coughs> um, after today I've got 10 days off so I'm going to go to my house in the south of England and um, have a listen and see if I can get some words together and stuff and you know, so we'll see what happens, maybe next year or the year after, something will happen, some, something. And the DVD? Ah no, no, a minute, no, I just want to get the songs, get the songs on first and see what's happening because like, we had these five in Germany, um, as I said, industrialised, the other stuff on what is not, but it's the end of the we want to sort of, can't mix the two together, so we have to keep them two separate things. So I'll see what happens in a minute. As I said, I can't comment on anything in a minute. You've made a song that's a legend, Running Free. What's the history of that song, Running Free? <laughs> the song's about growing up in East Side London, there'd be no money, nothing, and don't give a fuck, <laughs> basically. Um, I always dedicate to my motorcycle clubs, Hells Angels and stuff, so it's all, it's all about that. It's all about Harleys and fucking around and you know, having a good time, basically. And, not really giving a shit because we had no we had no money to do anything anyway. So everything he did, he had to you know, have fun with it. And the history of the other song, the Killers, that you yeah. wrote. That song was uh, I tried to write a song about um, I don't know. Like, it's like a fucking well, obviously like a killer. Um, I tried to do it in three ways. It's like you know what he thinks, what the public think, and you know. In general, what I was thinking about is uh, trying to mix it all together. So, you know, that was it. It's kind of a weird thing. The original, which is on the live DVD of uh, Made in Labour, is different words. Like, cause those words, uh, they were going to play it instrumentally. I'm like, fuck, I didn't have, I, I had ideas on the melody line and that, but I didn't have any, any words, so I made them up on the stage. And I can't even remember what they were fucking like, so it doesn't matter anymore. Have you met Lee Carpenter, Major? Me and Lee, I'm oh, Lee, I used to watch him when I, was, when I was younger, playing in London and stuff, and uh, yeah, oh, I can't say he was an inspiration of mine, but he's a, he's a mate. So we, we grew up in the same part of East London together, so that's all good. Big star in Japan, he is. What do you know about Bulgaria as a country? Do you know something? I was married to one. I was married to a Bulgarian <laughs> woman. Uh, about 10 years ago, she's here, but she won't speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> I bought some flowers to say hi, and she said, no, I'm going to keep this professional. What do you mean professional? What, what, what the fuck? Professional in what way? I, I think she does journalism or whatever. And, uh, what, uh, what, 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 uh, would you describe your previous band, Battlezone and Killers? What about them? <laughs> well, Battlezone 
was killers. It's the same band. We just had a couple of Any idea life. for a reunion, a reunion with the previous No, we, well, we've done the last album in uh, 2000, Film One Penny. That was it. Uh, no, no. Um, and Killers, we fired about seven years ago now. That's, it was becoming a joke because uh, all the guys wanted to do was just have fun and get drunk and stuff. And they all had jobs. And music is my life, as I've ever done. So, me and Lee, we fired the band at the airport. They was going to go meet us, and I said, no, you're not going to be there, boys. You know, I've got my Italian boys going to take over, and let's go. So that's it, so. And, uh, another question. Yes, sir. Tell something special to your fans in Bulgaria. What can your I say? Motto, your motto, I don't know. What I want to say is thank you for coming to the shows. Um, Thanks for being there always, that's all I can say. No, they've, they've been fantastic, but I've got the greatest fans around the world anyway, so it's awesome. Make you have a photo with you. Yeah, certainly. One last thing just, and do you think to work again with Dennis Stratton maybe? No, I don't think so, I fucking hate him. Oh, <laughs> sorry for question. No, I don't speak to so, Dennis Stratton. No, I don't speak to Dennis Stratton. Dennis is an arsehole, man, because like, he fucked up Lee and everybody when we done this thing in Poland. Um, with the true Brits, uh, all, all, you know, we, we did that stuff over there and it was like for a charity thing. And the night before I arrived, he fucking gave everybody LSD and got all fucked up. He's an idiot, man. I don't know, for him. When we done that, um, you know, like, was first Iron Man shit and all that or whatever. It was Lee's idea, but I did it in a different studio. I wouldn't go anywhere near Dennis. <laughs> if I see him, I'm going to kill him. Thank you. Thank you all.
Dennis Stratton played guitar in Iron Maiden from 1979 until 1980. He played on the band's debut album, also called Iron Maiden. Stratton, however, left the band in October of 1980 due to conflicts with Steve Harris and band manager Rod Smallwood. He was to be replaced with Adrian Smith from the band Urchin. Stratton played with bands like Lionheart and Praying Mantis and he went on to form a project called The Original Iron Men which also featured ex-Iron Maiden vocalist Paul Diano. This was done in 1995 and they ended up releasing no less than three albums. Denny Stratton still performs live at gigs and venues in London area. Thank you. 
being the graphic artist for a band like Iron Maiden is one hell of a challenge. The graphic artist that did a hell of a lot of work for Iron Maiden all through the years is none other than Derek Riggs. His first picture of Eddie was entitled Electric Matthew Says Hello. This was for a possible punk cover, but my maiden's management came across it while looking through Riggs's portfolio. They asked him to add hair to the figure, and Eddie was born. The picture was used for Iron Maiden's debut album in 1980. Riggs did all of the Iron Maiden artwork from then on until 1992. It could be argued there hasn't been a decent Iron Maiden cover since Riggs left. He has also done artwork for Bruce Dickinson. Stratovarius, Gamma Ray and many other bands. These days, Derek lives in California as he suffers from SAD. On every I Made an Album, single and uh, EP, whatever, that Derek Riggs has designed, it's a cool thing to do to find his logo. On all albums and all, all covers, he was well known for hiding his logo somewhere in the picture. Have a look through your Iron Maiden collection and see if you can find the Derek Riggs logo. Also, see if you can find a black cat. This was also on many Iron Maiden artworks. Derek Riggs is a British artist from Portsmouth, England, born in 1958. Derek was a self-taught cartoonist since childhood. Like many children, he was in love with the comics and drawings of Jack Kirby, father of the Captain America, Fantastic Four, X-Men, and many others. He also liked horror movies and books from the 60s and 70s, and these influences would be reflected in his future works. He decided to study fine arts at the university, a place that he left shortly after feeling misunderstood. In his search for a style of his own, he began experimenting with numbers of designs while freelancing doing covers for London Records Company. In one of many works he presented, there was a painting entitled Electric Matthew Says Hello which was actually paint for a punk album cover. The look of this character was an exaggerated vision of all those punk clichés represent on an angry monster with a torn shirt. That peculiar piece caught the attention of music manager Rod Smallwood, who was looking for an image that would identify a new band called Iron Maiden that he was representing and that was about to release their first album. Smallwood later said the members of the band were very shy, so we had to invent a creature that stand up for them. The band adopted the creature after making a few minor modifications. They add more hair to make him look less punk and rename him Eddie. This name was originally from a mask they use in stage backdrops. Eddie's first appearance was on the cover of the single Running Free. On this cover, his face was not visible. It was until the release of the album when the mascot that would represent the band to this day could be seen. With an exclusive contract, Derek Riggs would spend much of the 80s illustrating Eddie in several ways. A year after the release of the first album, the second would arrive, Killers, the last album with the frontman Paul Diano. The cover had a smiling Eddie 
with a bloody axe. In the background, there is a block of flats. This background was inspired by the buildings where Riggs himself lived in those times. But it would be with the third album when things would change drastically. Iron Maiden, with a new singer, would go from being a promising bang of the new wave of British heavy metal to being one of the main exponents of the genre, hand in hand with the creation of Derek Riggs, a monster that would begin his path to immortality. The cover was originally created for the song Purgatory from the last album, but Rod Smallwood thought it was too good for a single release and decided to save it for the number of the beast. For the following album, Derek Riggs would represent Eddie Lobotomized, then as an Egyptian pharaoh. And for the Somewhere in Time album, as a cyborg in a futuristic Blade Runner inspired environment. This war is one of the most complex made by Riggs, with a huge amount of detail and reference to previous Iron Maiden albums and songs. It also contains little visual jokes and reference add by the artist. It took him three months to complete the painting. The process wore him out completely, as he underestimated the complexity of the artwork, and said he would never paint anything this convoluted ever again. From then on, the covers of Iron Maiden were gaining popularity, as the group expanded its legend. The covers of Peace of Mind, Power Slave, Somewhere in Time, Seven Song of a Seven Song, or No Prayer for the Dying, were a success, creating merchandising of Eddie as teachers, pins, patches, posters, keyring, even Christmas cards. But little by little, some creative tension was growing between the illustrator and the band, mainly with the manager, Rod Smallwood. The cover of Fear of the Dark in 1992 was the breaking point between Derek Riggs and Iron Maiden. His ideas were rejected as they want to update Eddie from the 80s comic style to a more realistic horror. Derek Riggs was always jealous of the originality of his art, and there began the tensions. He was annoyed that the ideas put forward by the band's musicians were copied from popular movies or books. The illustrator spent long hours sketching dozens of original concepts that were discarded while they proposed ideas that he detested. And that's how in the 90s Derek Riggs stopped being Iron Maiden's main illustrator, although he did some single, live and compilation album covers. Nothing will ever be the same between them. But Derek did not start working, with the fame he had acquired being the cover artist of one of the most famous heavy metal bands, many required his services. Bands like Destiny, Stratovarius, Gamma Ray put Rick's art on their records. Even Bruce Dickinson hired him for the cover of his solo album, Accident of Birth. At that time, less and less illustration was made with their usual oil and acrylic painting techniques. And it seemed that digital art became his main resource. But this was not only for an artistic decision. After years of using paint and associated products that contained, ironically, heavy metals, this led to health problems. So he focused mostly on digital, but without losing his particular style of character design. In the year that followed, he also worked on book covers, advertising, and he even went back to work with Iron Maiden on a few covers for a single and a compilation album. He is living in Riverdale County, California. He often attends conventions where he interacts with his fans, 
were exciting to get an autograph, a small drawing, or simply admire their art that has endured through generations, from the father of the most iconic creature in heavy metal. Doug Sampson was the drummer in Maiden from 1978 until 1979. He was the drummer on the legendary Soundhouse tapes, which was recorded on the 31st of December in 1978. Sampson left Maiden on the 22nd of December 1979, following health issues brought on by the band's then extensive touring schedule. He went on to form Air Force and has toured heavily in the London circuit. He still plays with Air Force to this day, performing both home in the UK and abroad. Dennis Roy Wilcock was a singer in Iron Maiden from 1976 to 1978. He was the one that introduced theatrics into the Maiden stage show using fake blood, fire and face paint in his performances. After leaving Iron Maiden, he formed V1 with Terry Wapram. They finished in 1979. He reformed the band in 2015 and they called themselves GV1 and a four-piece band with Terry Rapram also in the band. That sadly fell through in 2016 and he hasn't done anything musically since then. Paul Cairns was a guitarist with Iron Maiden from 1978 to 1979. He appeared on the Soundhouse tapes, but was never actually credited for it. His nickname was Mad Mac. The only other band he played in was called Southern Country, way back in 2011. These days he can often be seen busking. If anybody knows the whereabouts of Paul Keynes, do please get in contact with Rock's Network. We'd love to hear what he's been up to. Back into the mists of time. Um, back to 1974 and mm -hmm. uh, to start with, because you are, you were and still are very much part of the DNA that became Iron Maiden. And I do think you're perfectly in your rights to take some credit for that. You were there right at the very start. We, well, we, we, we proudly, and very proudly, actually count ourselves at the top of the Iron Maiden family tree. Absolutely. Um, and, and you probably know uh, the story, but um, uh, I went to my secondary school, it was a grammar school actually, was Lakeland County High School for Boys, who was a luminary other than, um, you know, quite a few reasonably famous people at East End School uh, passed through it. But um, I was there at the same time as Steve Harris. We went to school together and Paul Diano went to the same school as well, but he's five years younger than me. So, you know, you never mix with kids that much younger, but, no. but and I, I see Paul now, I speak to Paul reasonably regularly and we, we reminisce you know, about those times. So, um, so yes, yeah, Steve and I, he was in a year below me at school. So we did know each other reasonably well. And he lived about, well, just under a mile from where I did in East London. He lived in Leighton Stone. I lived in Leighton. Um, and when I left school, which was in May 1973, 
Um, Steve had, had left previously, not long before, but, but previously. Um, we sort of met up without school uniforms, such as it was, and, uh, and, and we both shared a common love of rock music, a common love of West Ham United Football Club. Um, and obviously we knew each other at school. So we said what we wanted to do was to start a band. And it was like, Steve was, I'd like to become a bassist because he wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and I helped him. He and I bought his first bass, which contrary to what sometimes you see in the biographies was a Fender Telecaster copy bass, which I think cost about 40 quid. Um, and he, um, he embarked with a bit of help for me. He did have a little bit of help for me because I'd been playing guitar a couple of years before that to learn bass. He picked up very quickly. So, but, so that's where we started that journey in, in 1973. Um, um, he and I, again, you know, having gone through, having trying to find somebody to play drums and somebody else to play guitar and someone else to do that, formed a band called Influence in the autumn of 1973 which after a few, I say, line-up changes, became Gypsy's Kiss in the spring, winter, spring of 1974. And we played our first gig, I think it was in March 74. Um, um, and, and so, yes, that, that, that's sort of how it started. And, and, uh, and part of the reason, I've told this story quite a few times before, part of the reason, uh, Gypsy's Kiss were actually quite a good band. There were mm -hmm. four of them, and we added a second guitarist, five. Um, in, in our peers at the time, we were, I, I think we would all say pretty good. Um, but I was 19 then, Steve was 18. Um, Paul Sears on drums, who's still a good mate of mine, was the same age as me. Um, so we were young lads. And one of the reasons Steve has become such an iconic, probably best rock bass player in the world, Absolutely. great writer, multi millionaire, um, is because he had what a lot of people don't have. He had the ability. We all had a bit of ability, but he had dedication and hard work ethic. Absolutely. Mm. All he wanted to do was to play more and rehearse and write better songs. And what the rest of us wanted to do was to go out drinking and partying and, and things like that. So, so he, that. his dedication paid off. And I, I spoke to him last uh, a year ago, maybe less than that. Um, you know, and we, we sort of reminisced on that. And I play back to him that, you know, aside his talent which is huge his dedication has got him to where he has because the, the you'll know this carrie the music world is littered with talented musicians yes um but it's not littered with talented musicians who've got dedication and drive and, no, and that's that's what it takes so, so that that's how that started so you know proud to say formed a band with steve that's at the top of the iron maiden family tree and a lot of people you know, I, we knew in, in the, the, the East London music scene and was very vibrant. Well, pub rock was in its mm -hmm. was starting up, uh, well, starting out. It had been running a few years, but it, it was there, there were plenty of places to play, you know, which, which there aren't now. Um, and people went to see bands every Friday and Saturday religiously. We um, played at the Carlton Horses and the Bridge House and other places that became reasonably well known in East London for rock music. We played at the Carton Horses a lot because we went in there and you'd go in any Friday or Saturday night and the place would be absolutely full. Whoever was playing, didn't matter. You know, no. people went out to see bands, which they do less so now, sadly. Mm. Um, um, and you know, we, we played and enjoyed it. And uh, that, that the band then came to, I think, a natural end. And we all went and did different things. Steve formed Iron Maiden. I played in lots of bands between them and now from wedding bands, event bands, country and Western bands and, and stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a good time to, uh, it was a great time for rock music. My favorite period, rock music seventies. Absolutely. Well, you can tell that from, uh, your, your thing. No, God, uh, no. you brushed swords with Iron Maiden, didn't you? In, in I did. 77 and 78 and you, yeah. you seem to have always in the early days particularly of Iron Maiden you, you seem to be in orbit almost and, and centrally involved somehow because um you were in Iron Maiden itself uh, yeah. and, and and you know left in 1980 wasn't it I believe 
No, no, I'd left way before then. Oh, it's about um, 78, 79 ish. No, you're still ahead of, ahead of the time. 77, oh. I was with Maiden. Was it? Oh. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, Thunderstick didn't exist then. It was only little old me. And I wasn't in the band for that long, you know. It was um, mm. it was a, a kind of work in progress for Steve. Yeah. And, um, and I kind of just moved on, and that and that was it. It was very strange the way it came about that I left. It, I never actually officially left, believe it or not, or I didn't get the sack either. Um, it was just something that came about because the singer at the time, Dennis Wilcock, um, he kind of um, – decided that he wasn't going to turn up for a couple of gigs and he wanted to leave. And um, I put a, a gig together in South London and I was down there. I, I unpacked all my drums. I set them all up and waiting for the rest of the band to turn up. They turned up minus the singer. And now this is where it kind of gets hazy because I can't remember if we actually did the gig with Steve kind of muddling his way through singing the vocals for that night or the way i remember it was that we sat around and had a drink and and it was kind of that was it you know steve was in a, a kind of low place and he was like oh i don't know what the hell's going on with this like you know i'm i'm a good mind to go back to uh, college and because he was studying um a draftsman it was going to be a draftsman and he said i think you know i'm going to head back to college and one thing and another and that was how it was left and um you we kind of just went our separate ways i didn't hear from him and i didn't follow it up either and and lo and behold you know the next thing that i knew was that they would got a new drummer and away they went so but by that time i had joined samson and uh and Thunderstick had been born, and it was you know I managed I managed to get front cover of the the, the publication Sounds, yeah, and yeah. It, it brought a lot of attention to Samson, which was good, and uh, yeah, and and we went on from there really. And and again, Samson gave us Bruce Dickinson, Bruce Dickinson, and Clive, <laughs> and Clive, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because uh, Clive, uh, Clive, Clive and I actually changed places. I was with Maiden whilst he was with Samson, and we literally changed places. I went to Samson, he went to Maiden, um, and we actually, uh, you know, right in the early days, I, I believe he still had his, his drum cases with Samson stenciled on them, <laughs> and I still had Iron Maiden stenciled on mine, <laughs> which was a bit weird. But yeah, I mean, they we by that time we we kind of met up again because um, Samson we had the heavy metal crusade, mm. and the management of Samson were putting that actual tour together, and they were looking for support bands, and I suggested Maiden because I'd been in the band, and I said, yeah, yeah, I mean they're a great band and they'd be really really good. So we went out as a three band package: Angel Witch, Iron Maiden, and Samson. And after that tour, the Christmas of 1979, I suddenly got a phone call from Steve Harris. And he said, hello, Steve here. And I went, Steve who? And he went, Harris, you idiot. Um, would you fancy coming back to Maiden? <laughs> and they had just, um, this is before Clive, mm -hmm. they had just parted company with Dougie Sampson because he unfortunately had something wrong with his hands. And yeah. What, yeah, what was happening was that when he was playing and touring, the sound engineer, this is how it was told to me, that the sound engineer would start with his faders you know, on his drums quite low. And by the end of the gig, the faders were right at the very top of the, of the board and they couldn't get any more volume out of him. And that was because he was getting weak and he wasn't hitting mm -hmm. the drums in the, in the same way. And... So that for me was a real dilemma because, um, as I said, you know, I was with Samson, I'd already got sounds and Thunderstick had been born. Steve didn't want Thunderstick, they just wanted me. Yeah. And it ruined my Christmas that year, it really did. And I said, well, look, I'll tell you what, why don't we get a, record, a rehearsal studio together after Christmas and I'll come down and have a play. Um, and that's what happened. Um, and I've got it all in my diaries of the time that I was keeping. And um, 
by the time we did the, about the fourth or fifth song, it was quite inevitable that I wasn't right for it because my style of drumming had changed quite a lot. I was a lot more flamboyant and I was putting a lot more in, whereas Steve wanted that bass and drums unity. Yeah. They wanted it just to sit. You know, he wants a drum, like Nico, really. I yeah. mean, Nico is not a drummer, and, and I, I say this in the best possible way I can say it. There is no way do I put down anything that Nico does because he's a great drummer. But he plays for Iron Maiden. He plays for mm. Steve, and they just stick together, and that's what Steve wanted. Whereas I was kind of, you know, branching out a lot more and was a lot more flamboyant. And that was to be seen after we had recorded Head On. Um, mm. you, could, you could see by my drumming that by what I mean there, you know, it was a lot more, a lot more. Um, I had a lot more flair to it than Steve wanted. So, you know, fourth or fifth song that we'd done, and and when I was with them first time round, the majority of the material that we did all ended up on the first two albums, the uh, mm -hmm. I made them first album and then Killers, yeah. So uh, I, I knew the material, um, and by that time they were they were looking at doing um, the new song they'd written was Running Free, and um, I did that with them. And I went back, and yet again, um, it, it was quite plain to see that I wasn't right, and, and I thanked everybody and hoped that I didn't waste their time. And then we were in... Kingsway, which which was Ian Gillan's studio, we were recording there. Uh, Samson, this is, and um, a phone went, and John McCoy from Gillan, who was who was um, producing the album, and um, I think it was, I think no, by that time, yeah, no, it was, it was Survivors, yeah. Uh, so John answered the phone in the studio and came back and went, guess what? I've just found out who the new, new Iron Maiden drummer is. And we, we went, okay, who is it? And sure enough, it was Clive. And that was it. So we we actually, you know, swapped places. Yeah, so, yeah but very oh, wow. incestuous. As you say, it's, it's rock and roll, isn't it? It's so incestuous. It's, I mean, you know, everybody... Yeah. It's Especially nice. back then, with everybody toing and froing in each other's bands, as and trying to find where where metal and rock was going, really. Yeah, but exactly. Punk it, was in and it. out, and oh, yeah. it, was, it was it was a crazy time, but a very productive time at the same. It was time. a very, I mean, you know, hence New Wobbum that came out of yeah, that. Absolutely. Mm, yeah. And you, Terry Rance was a guitarist in Maiden from 1975 to 1976. Little is known about what he's been up to since then. He now runs Eddie's Bar in Portugal. This is all owned by I Maiden bassist Steve Harris. Oh, I, I, I suppose everybody's favourite story is how, how I Maiden came to play here. They were at this point established as the biggest rock band in the world and they were on a world tour and I mean a world tour, I don't mean they, they visited Germany, they literally flew across to from Poland right through the Iron Curtain countries as they were known in them days, through to Russia, back down the southern hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, across to South America, from South America into North America and then back home, took them a year. Probably one of the biggest tours a rock band's ever been on and um, they were only back a couple of months and they're their manager, Smallwood, give them a year off. No recordings, no gigs, no nothing. Yeah. So Adrian Smith, who played here originally in a band called Urchin back in the very late 70s, very, very early 80s, um, he phoned me up and said, Tell, can we come down and do a gig? We're bored. And that's how that one came about, which is yeah. a pretty cool story. Yeah, definitely. Happened. And of course, we couldn't, um, I got a phone call from their manager, Smallwood again, saying that if he reads anywhere that I'm made in a plane, he would tuck it because contractual and legally they wouldn't be allowed to do it without his permission. So they called themselves the Sherman Tankers. And I remember having the post for you, I think that'd be worth now. They did two gigs that year. That was here and the Marquee in, in London. We were on the same sort of wavelength at the time. So they played here. And all I could do was go to people in the bar like you and go, come here Tuesday, yeah. I made a plane here. And they go, of course they are too. <laughs> and I managed to persuade 200 people to come down. 
Paul Mario Day was a vocalist in Iron Maiden from 1975 to 1976. He was actually fired from the band because they felt he didn't have enough stage charisma. He was replaced by Dennis Wilcock and went on to form a band called More. They played the legendary Monsters of Rock Festival in 1981 along with ex-Iron Maiden guitarist Paul Todd. He was the vocalist for a band called Wildfire between 1983 and 1984. And he appears as a guest musician with the band Buffalo Crows. He has actually moved to Australia way back in 1986 and has performed with two other bands as well, Defaced and Crimson Lake. Terry Wapram played guitar in the band between 1977 and 1978. He has also played in the band V1 and the Ides of March. He can now be found playing with his own band Buffalo Fish. They usually play around the London area but are more than happy, we understand, to play gigs anywhere in the country. He's often seen playing alongside Gypsy's Kiss with other fellow members of band X I Maiden and he's often seen jamming with other I Maiden members as well at the Carton Horses. (laughs) 